Hello everybody. So today we are starting our next lesson, which is looking at linear modeling. So basically linear modeling is using um, different patterns and stuff that we've been able to identify a rule for um, and then be able to represent it in some sort of graph. So we can use an equation in the form of y equals mx plus c to represent a real life equation. So by the end of this lesson, we will be able to identify variables in real life contexts. We'll be able to sketch graphs and find solution to given problems and predict the values from graphs. So looking at how to solve real life applications using our y equals mx plus c and predicting different values. All right. So in terms of what linear modeling is in mathematics, it's often possible to represent patterns in nature and real life using some sort of rule or model and that rule that we're referring to is in that format y equals mx plus c. So when the rule is linear we call this linear modeling. So when working with these examples the variables that we've been using so far have been x and y but that's not always going to be the case. So you might use c to represent cost, d to represent distance, any variable as long as you define what it means okay so defining what the letter that you've chosen um, actually representing so let's look at an example all right so this is also on page 100 of your textbooks but basically we've got Jules who is organizing the annual year 11 dance the total cost for the event is going to include $500 venue hire um, $280 for the DJ and $25 per head, so per person, for food. The maximum capacity of the venue, so the maximum number of people that the venue can hold, is 200 The table below shows the cost for the number of students and attending the dance. So C stands for cost, N stands for the number of students. So... A linear model of the form C equals A plus BN can be used to identify the cost of the event C for N students. Okay, so what we're probably going to be asked to do is figure out what the value of A is going to be and the value of B is going to be because C and N are the variables that we're using. So here we go. Find the value of A and B and hence write down the linear model for C in terms of N. So what you're going to firstly have to do is choose two points on the line from the table. So we're going to look at this table and we're going to identify two coordinates that we could use. So let's use this one here, 880 and 2780. And let's use 100 and 3280. So as our coordinates, they would be written as 80,2780 and 100 comma 3280. So remember when we have two coordinates we can figure out what our gradient is going to be by looking at what we did yesterday okay so gradient is going to be y2 take away y1 divided by x2 take away x1 or you can input um, both of those coordinates into your CAS calculator and it will come up with a equation for you okay so when you graph it remember it can come up with the equation if you were confused on how to do that go back to yesterday's video but you're basically going to end up with c equals 780 plus 25 n okay so in this case what does a in this represent okay so the a value represents our um cost if no students attend. So our y-intercept when x is 0, or rather our c-intercept when n is 0. So it basically represents um, the cost of the dance if no students attend. So it asks us why doesn't this value make sense in this context? Well, really, in real life, if the numbers were looking that low where we had zero people attending, we actually would probably just end up cancelling the booking. Okay, so the money he would lose would be any deposits that he paid. Okay, so maybe the deposit for the DJ, um, he would lose that rather than the venue cost. 
All right, in terms of sketching, okay, the graph, what you would do is you would put the graph that you got in your calculator um, and you would copy the major coordinates down, okay, or you could choose two coordinates, okay, um, and then graph them accordingly. So I've got a picture here of what that graph would look like, okay, so if you were to put that into your um, calculator, you'd get a graph that looks like that. All right, part D, what would be the total cost of the dance if 105 students attend? So we have got our rule, okay, which we have over here. And this is what we are going to be using to identify this. So this is sort of the major thing that we've been able to identify and everything is gonna go off of this rule. So we are trying to figure out what the cost would be, what C would be, if N is 105. So let's go 780 plus 25 times N. Cost would therefore um, be where N instead is going to be 105. Okay, so we'd write 105 instead. And if we were to figure that out, that would be 3,405. Okay, so the cost of the dance will be $3,405 if 105 people attend. All right, according to the linear model, what would be the total cost? So again, you're asked to figure out C if 1,000 students attended. Okay, so if we go 1,000 students, we would go again, C equals 780 plus 25N, but instead of N, we're going to have 1,000 we put that into our calculator, we would get 25,780. Okay, so it then asks why isn't this figure a reliable prediction of the cost? Okay, this wouldn't be really reliable because what is the venue's maximum capacity? It had told us up here that the maximum capacity is 200, but we've actually calculated it for a thousand students. So Jules would probably need to find another um, venue and a different model would therefore apply to that. Okay, so the major thing that you needed to find out to be able to do basically questions C to E um, was to figure out your actual equation. Okay, so this part here is the most important part to be able to identify. So we do that again just by finding two coordinates on the graph putting it into your CAS, okay, and graphing that. Um, and it will come up with the equation next to it, or you can do it by hand where you physically figure out what the gradient is. You would then end up with an equation that looks like y equals mx plus c, where you've got your gradient because you figured it out using the y2 take y1 over x2 take x1. And then you can take one of these points and substitute it, okay? So 80 would be that c value, 2780 would be that y value and then solve it for c to get your y-intercept as well. Alrighty, moving on to the next example. Again, all of it's written out here for you to look at if you would like. You can pause the video. But the next part is looking at predictions, interpolation and extrapolation. So basically, if we have a linear graph, we can use this linear model to make predictions by substituting different values into our equation. So in real life, okay, some of these predictions aren't always going to be reliable. So in the above example that we looked at, the cost was only reliable for 80 to 200 students. But if we were trying to extrapolate more than that, um, it was going to be unreliable because of the maximum capacity. So this range of values is called the domain. The domain is basically looking at your x values that we have um, to deal with. So predicting within the known range is called interpolation. So if I have my graph, okay, and I know the values for this point to this point, all right, the data that's within here is called interpolation, okay? So we are estimating based on the data that we have, okay, but predicting outside of the known data range is called extrapolation. So extrapolation would be all of the data 
out here. If we're guessing for any x values out here or x values out here, we would call that extrapolation. Okay, an extrapolation. So interpolation is for the values inside the domain that we've been told or we know of. Okay, and the data that we've been able to identify extrapolation is looking at um, extending our data. So predictions that involve interpolation are always more reliable than predictions that involve extrapolation. All right, what we can also do, okay, a lot of data that we deal with, maybe in science, you might have to graph different points, okay? Usually it makes a trend that it's a linear trend, okay? So we can see from this graph here that we've got a linear, you know, all of these dots are leaning in a linear direction, but we have to put a line of best fit, okay? So however, it sometimes approximately follows the straight line, okay? So this is what we call the line of best fit, but it might be interpreting what our data is. So most of the time, the data we're dealing with doesn't form a perfect straight line. So we sort of estimate that, okay, this is the trend that this data is following. So a basic way that we kind of do this is the number of dots or the number of points that are on one side of the line is going to be roughly equal to the number of dots um, on the other side of the line. So they balance each other out. All right. So looking at an example here. So a criminologist analyzed data on how the number of crimes, okay, so number of crimes we've been told is C, committed per month in a big city changes as the number of police officers, so P, patrolling the city increased. The data was plotted on the graph shown. So we have been given as the number of um, police patrolling increases, our crimes, okay, are decreasing. It's a negative gradient graph. So although the data didn't fit perfectly in a straight line, she drew a line of best fit, okay? So this blue line here that she's drawn, okay, um, is a line of best fit based on those orange data points. So what is the C-intercept of the line of best fit and what does it represent? Okay, so we're looking at, in terms of our axes, our y-intercept. So our C-intercept is our crimes per month. So where on our axes do we hit um, our line? Okay, where does our line cross over? And it crosses over at that point that I've just marked X. So we have to try to identify what that point is. Okay, okay. So the C-intercept is going to be that halfway point between 3,000 and 3,500, okay, which would therefore be 3,250, okay. And what it represents is the number of crimes per month if no police officers were present. So the value of C when P equals zero. We need to then identify the point on the line other than the C-intercept that can be read with reasonable accuracy. So you basically follow this line, okay, to see if there's any points where it kind of matches up exactly on the grid. And we can see that this point here, okay, 250 and 2,500 actually hits exactly at an intersection where we can identify an exact coordinate. So that would be the example that we could use there, okay? So 250 and 2,500. All right, part C says use the two points from A and B to find the slope of the graph. So I have two coordinates. This coordinate would be written like this to now find the gradient. So remember gradient, okay, I'm just gonna do it on this side here, is going to be M equals Y2 take away Y1 over x2 take away x1. So if we identify that, let's say that y2 is 2,500, take away x2, which is, uh, sorry, y2, which is 3,250, over x2, which is 250, take away x1, which is zero, all right, I would get an answer of negative three. And that works with our graph, okay, a negative gradient. Yes, our graph is a negative gradient, and we have identified that it is a value of three. So basically that slope represents the rate of change in crime as the police numbers increase. So for every increase in the number of police officers by one, the number of crimes is decreasing by three per month. Okay. Um, 
Part D says, what is the equation of the line of best fit? So basically what we would then do is have a look at our gradient and have a look at our y-intercept. So we need to put it in the form of crime equals, um, what was our gradient? Negative 3. Our x-axis is P, okay, and our y-intercept was 3,250. So we're going to go plus 3,250. So for every equation, we're going to have our gradient and our y-intercept. Okay, part E, we have to use this equation to predict how many crimes would be committed per month when 125 police officers are on patrol. So we're trying to calculate C when P is 125 and that's just subbing in directly into our equation so basically c is going to equal negative 3 times 125 plus 3250 and my answer would be if we put that into our calculator 2875 so that means 2875 crimes would be committed per month when 125 police officers are on patrol all right part f says use the equation of the line to predict how many police officers. So now we have to try to figure out the p-value would be to require to reduce the number of crimes to 1,900 per month. Okay, so we want this is our c-value and we have to calculate our p-value. So basically we're going to sub that in. So I'm going to go c, 1,900 equals negative 3p plus 3,250 to calculate what p is so i can rearrange my equation subtract 3250 from both sides and then divide both sides by negative three or i can do solve on my cas so solve comma p okay and we would get a p value of 450 so you can do it um, algebraically or you can put it into your calculator so that would mean that 450 police officers would be required to reduce the number of crimes um, to 1900 all right, and finally, what would give more reliable prediction from this model? The crimes per month when 175 police officers were patrolling or when 500 police officers were patrolling. So if we think about the data that we've been given, we know the values from 0 to 300. I'll just do it in green, from 0 to 300. So any value between 0 to 300, that would be interpolation, correct? because that is for known values of data that we've got along here. Anything more than 300, okay, would be extrapolation. So if we are dealing with 175, 175 fits within the data that we know, okay, so that would be more accurate, whereas 500 is um, falling way above the data that we know, okay, so that would be extrapolation. So the original data values, because they range from 50 to 300, 175 police officers falls within the range. So this model would be more reliable for interpolation rather than the extrapolation of the prediction for 500 officers. All right. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Otherwise, the questions you are completing um, is exercise 3.3. Thank you.